I'm joined in this segment by Dr. Brandon Snook, a good friend of mine and a member of Southern Hills Baptist Church. Dr. Snook is an ER trauma surgeon at UMC Hospital. He's a retired Air Force Colonel um, and served at UMC Hospital during the tragic uh, events of the Route 91 tragedy on October 1st, just a few years ago. He is also a future medical missionary with his wife, Kate, and his entire family to Togo, West Africa, and a 15-year uh, member of Southern Hills. Um, today we're joined to talk specifically about COVID-19, the coronavirus crisis that's happening around the world, and many questions that were sent in to us by members of Southern Hills Baptist Church. Uh, Dr. Snook is not in any way claiming to be a specialist in the realm of uh, pandemics or um, an epidemiologist, but he does like to speak into this subject for our church members as a way to communicate about medicine during this specific time. And from a trusted authority within our congregation, a brother in Christ, Dr. Snuck, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, let's jump right into it because a lot of those questions that came in, they came in fast and furious and a lot of our members don't have access to you like i do we talk all the time i can call you anytime i want uh, but a lot of questions that i've talked to you about maybe our members haven't had the first question that came in was about ventilators um and let me jump to that first question here the first question that came in is ventilators for coronavirus patients good thing or bad thing uh definitely good i think um it's not a good situation when somebody requires a ventilator um, that being said, uh, a ventilator is something that helps someone breathe when they can't or when their lungs are too sick to uh, deliver oxygen to their body. So um, for whatever reason, uh, whether it's after surgery or somebody is sick with a pneumonia, um, ventilators are very commonly used uh, in sick patients. So in this pa patient population, it's the same as any other. It's a um, it's a bad situation when someone's that sick that they need to be on a ventilator, but ventilators are definitely good. One of the things that's been discussed uh, ad nauseum here on social media, as well as the media itself, is the concept of stay-at-home order versus herd immunity. One question, actually many questions came in. Dr. Snook, where do you stand between stay-at-home and isolate versus herd immunity? Um, well, it's, we're in unique times. Uh, this is really uh, kind of... Uh, situation that our country and honestly our world has not been in um, probably in over a hundred years. So I think that it's um, at this point a little bit of both. The stay at home uh, I think is definitely something that's needed um, at least up until this point and maybe even for a little bit longer because there are some real concerns if everyone in the population was exposed to this at the same time. Um, and a percentage of them got sick enough to need to go into the hospital, um, there's a real possibility of overwhelming the hospital systems to where uh, people that needed to maybe be on a ventilator couldn't actually have access to get on a ventilator. So um, the goal would be over time, uh, you know, the entire population or um, a large percentage would become immune to this, uh, whether it's through a vaccine or a combination of that, plus maybe being exposed to it. Um, but the problem specifically to this virus is um, it affects um, older people and really kind of vulnerable people that have a lot of comorbid medical problems. Um, and if everyone was just exposed to it, including those individuals, um, a lot of people could could die from it. So. Okay, so the concept of the stay-at-home order itself has actually been extremely beneficial, not only here in the state of Nevada, but around the country and around the world at this point. Uh, but eventually, as you're saying, herd immunity does need to take effect and probably will. It, I, it will. I think um, initially uh, you want to maybe limit the number of people that are exposed to this. I think, um, honestly, this is something we're probably going to be dealing with, um, you know, kind of in the future. And so this just gives us time to, you know, work on a vaccine and potential treatments uh, for this uh, for this virus. OK, in regards to the stay at home order, another question came in actually multiple times. People asked it very in rand various and random ways. The same question. Does the stay at home order run counterproductive to strengthening our immune system? Uh, I would say in you know, kind of what we're probably five, six weeks into this now. Um, over a short period of time, no. But if, you know, we're staying at home and not uh, kind of getting out and connecting and, um, you know, with other people and 
being exposed to um, you know different organisms and that sort of thing, um, it could potentially have a negative effect. But you know, over the course of you know weeks to maybe even a couple months, probably not. Okay, good to hear. Here's the next question in regards to UMC specifically. And if you're watching from out of town, um, UMC is is obviously our university medical center and one of the core hospitals of our city and state. Their question is, will, when will UMC Hospital open up for elective surgery? Uh, some people are very hurting right now when it comes to the need for surgery. Yeah, that's really a good question, and I think it's, it's one that's actively being looked at um, to the point of, I think, probably by next week. Um, there's actually uh, kind of all the hospitals across the Las Vegas Valley um, are in communication on this. Um, the goal is to start opening to some um, kind of medically necessary, uh, what we would say would be elective surgeries probably next week. Uh, it's not going to go back to exactly the same as it was before right away. It's going to be kind of a phased uh, reopening. But uh, next week, I believe, um, there's going to be some uh, elective surgery. So people that are out there that you know, maybe have uh, um, problems with a gallbladder or something like that that haven't been able to get in, I would definitely contact your physicians and, and uh, um, you know, because starting next week, and unless something, you know, significantly changes, um, pretty much all the, all the places across, hospitals across the valley should start um, to be opening to elective surgery. So that's very good news for you right now. If you're watching this on Sunday, you might have a little bit ahead of the curve by Monday morning contacting as quickly as possible some of the, so your, your physicians to see if you can schedule something because this time we're recording this on Wednesday, this time next week we may be starting to see that open up. Um, another question came in, since the CDC changed the PPE requirements in light of the shortage, isn't this quarantine a bit of a joke? Um, I would say... By the way, the concept of the quarantine being a joke came in yeah. multiple times. Can you help us understand this? Yeah, I think a um, couple things here. Uh, PPE stands for personal protective equipment. Um, and in hospitals, uh, that's very necessary in dealing with patients just on a daily basis. Um, but then, you know, in patients that are a little more infectious, like these patients, um, there are certain items, you know, special face masks and that sort of thing that need to be worn um, when dealing with these patients. Um, so from the standpoint of, um, you know, I think the CDC, and I would definitely um, suggest the cdc.gov website is a great website to go to to get information on, um, on the virus and kind of how to deal with it at home, disinfecting, that sort of thing. But, Initially, I think there was a significant concern for significant shortage for healthcare workers in dealing with these patients. So that's why, you know, um, there's really not a whole lot of need um, at that point to have everybody be able to have, you know, masks and that sort of thing. I think the goal was to kind of allow that to kind of get to the healthcare workers and the hospitals and that sort of thing. So. Um, I don't know if that answered that question. I think it does quite a bit. Okay. If if at the beginning of the at the beginning of the crisis we need to get this if this these materials as quickly as possible to the healthcare workers, then we need to tell the mass population that this is not as necessary for them. But now it seems like the requirements have changed a bit um, because the healthcare workers have what they need. Now it's being recommended that everyone has it. It doesn't seem like an overreaction at that point. It seems like the progression makes sense. Right, and I think the other thing, just to, to understand that um, kind of the general public, um, you know, I think knows and hears about, but, you know, just to, to be honest with people, the medical community is just getting to learn and know about this virus. So when they say it's a novel virus that means it's it's new this is not something that's been studied for years you know you think about like hiv aids that's a virus that's been around for a number of years and a lot of money and research and time has gone into that this is kind of we're at the very early point of this virus and so we're still learning about this and so and that's why it's you know oftentimes you watch the news it seems like things literally change from the morning till the afternoon and in, in some situations, you know, knowledge is, is growing kind of as we deal with this um, in the medical community. So I know nothing about medicine, but I do know about the scripture. And the Bible does talk about those who have received grace ought be individuals who disperse grace. 
we have been given much grace by God. We ought to be people who give grace to others. And, and I think that's true in, realms, in the realm of our politicians, though that's always difficult for me. Um, it's true in the realm of our medical community, uh, epidemiologists, and what Brandon is saying is a great truth for us as Christians to take, we as Christians, to give grace as the medical community um, does attempt their best to figure out this no novel virus um, because what they're going to say from one day to the next or from one week to the next may change and shift. And uh, we need to be patient with them during that time. And Christians, above all, ought be. So here's a good question about the quarantine. And this is absolutely a great question. And I, I kind of had the question myself until I talked with you. And that is, isn't it typical that the infected are the ones that are put into quarantine and not necessarily the healthy? Why, why do we see it seem to be opposite right now? Well, I would think a little bit of this is kind of definition of terms. Um, I think quarantine... Um, oftentimes does refer to someone that uh, is uh, infected or somebody that has been in direct contact with somebody who's been infected. Um, we're kind of talking about what are called mitigation strategies by keeping us a little bit apart from mixing with other people. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't say we're all quarantining ourselves, but we're socially distancing, I think is the appropriate uh, term. and trying to limit the spread of, of this virus because it is spread from direct person-to-person -person contact. So, Though our state has not been infected as many states have, and, and thank God we've mitigated and we haven't seen the spread throughout our, con uh, our state, we do have members of our own congregational family that have been infected. And we do have one question from one of our community sure. members that have been infected with the coronavirus. Um, how can I tell when the coronavirus has completely left my body? Um, well, I think a couple of things. One, um, obviously, if you've tested positive, you've had contact with a physician, somebody has ordered your test, follow up definitely with your physician. That being said, um, I think from what we know now, uh, from the time your symptoms end, um, and that's, you know, if you're having a fever uh, and that sort of thing, usually within probably at minimum 72 hours upwards of a, of a week, um, you should no longer be, um, you know, contagious. Um, that being said, uh, like I alluded to before, we're still learning about this, this virus, and we honestly don't know how long, um, you know, tests might remain positive as far as kind of detecting really small portions of the virus. So um, I would treat it, though, like, a, you know, kind of a, a cold or, you know, if you're ill, if you're still having fever, if you're still having cough, you're not over it. Um, but usually from the time symptoms um, start, um, you know, I think within two weeks, you should be pretty much completely rid of it. Um, that being said, if you're very sick with, with the virus, you're in the hospital, um, you're, you could be on a ventilator and kind of dealing with how this virus affects all the organ systems of your body for much longer than that. Okay. I have a question that came in multiple times and it has, re has a relation between, or it has to do with the relation between the flu and the virus itself. It says, in all honesty, isn't this virus simply just another, another flu? Um, well, a couple of things with that. Um, specifically, the type of virus is a, is a different type of virus. Um, it, it is a respiratory virus. This actually is the same type of virus that, I don't know if you remember back when the SARS um, kind of epidemic was, was a concern um, over, I think, in the early 2000s. This is that same sort of, of virus, but typically it causes upper respiratory symptoms. Uh, the symptoms, though, are very similar to, to the flu, uh, and um, meaning they can cause cough, runny nose, fever, um, so the symptoms to, you know, the individual that has it may be very similar to the flu. Um, one other thing just to kind of um, uh, put onto that is that um, since they are two different viruses, it'd be unlikely, but, um, you know, going into a flu season, which usually we're actually kind of coming out of now, um, if you have this virus and the flu virus, that can be kind of two, you know, kind of additive things on top of each other. So when so. people say, um, when we hear, well, this is not really that dangerous unless you are elderly or have a pre-existing condition, could it be possible that the flu itself on top of the virus kind of works as a pre-existing condition or something that can weaken the immune system to the point of fatality? Is that the idea? 
Um, it could, uh, you know, de definitely be something uh, in addition uh, to this virus if you had both you know, viruses at the same time. So. Okay. So with the question, a lot of them went in regards to the flu is why are we, why are we doing so much if this is simply just another flu, we don't do this every year? Well, I think um, it kind of goes back to the fact that this is a, a new virus. This is something that we have not dealt with. Um, we really don't know how it pl will play out kind of over an extended period of time. So like I said before, we're still learning a lot about how this virus behaves, um, exactly how it's spread. We think it's mostly from cough, sneezing, kind of what we call droplet exposure. But, um, you know, it, it, it honestly, at this point, seems to be a little bit more contagious than the flu and potentially um, a little bit more dangerous as far as kind of people that get seriously ill and mortality rates. But that is, is still kind of uh, something that we're going to have to kind of watch this over the course of a little more time. And your personal opinion about that, we, we hear the idea that this could be s extremely more contagious and extremely more deadly, and then we hear it could be a little bit more and a little bit more deadly. Um, where would you say, and I know we're so early on this, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, I think at this point it seems to be a little bit more uh, contagious, not um, and, and a little bit more concerning, um, but uh, I you know, can't say 100% for sure, but I think it's, the, the difference is, is the flu, um, we actually have some medications that can treat that if we diagnose it early on. And we also have a vaccine that is, you know, broadly available for people um, kind of at the extremes of age, the very young and the very old, um, you know, that's available. Um, and which, that then, we, which we don't have at this point for the coronavirus. Which then keeps it from overwhelming the entire system and the medical community is not overwhelmed, hence Correct. the flattening of the curve and the whole, the whole scenario we've been hearing for the last six weeks, Correct. which does lead us to the concept of the vaccine. Um, it's often talked about, what about a vaccine? What about a vaccine? In fact, this last week we heard maybe there's some great breakthroughs in regards to a potential vaccine, but there are members of our congregation, we have members from all walks of life that are very concerned about a vaccine as a whole. One question came in multiple times, and that is, uh, one was phrased, our family is very concerned about taking any vaccines at all. Are you concerned? Uh, um, are our concerns legitimate and valid? Well, I think any um, intervention from a medical standpoint, whether it's taking a medication, having surgery, taking a vaccine, you kind of have to weigh the, the pros and the cons and, and the risks and the benefits. That being said, um, you know, we have a family of five, and I'll, I'll just be honest with you, all of our kids get all their vaccinations. Um, and I think back to that herd immunity uh, question, um, one of the very important uh, mechanisms to allow people, uh, especially the ones that are the most vulnerable, to be, become immune to um, a disease is through a vaccine. And you look at you know, diseases over the time, course of time like measles, um, you know, mumps, tetanus, many of these um, polio is another one that uh, because of vaccines, we've basically almost eliminated uh, some of these very, very severe infectious diseases. And so I think that um, you definitely need to kind of do your, do your homework and, you know, talk to your physician. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think if a vaccine becomes available for this, uh, you know, it, it'd be something really to strongly consider. So. There's one aspect of the vaccine that I think I'll address because it has not to do with medical, but it has to do with um, conspiratorial, conspiratorial um, prophetic teachings. Um, I've seen passed around on social media quite a bit the idea that um, uh, Bill Gates and um, a patent for a vaccine that uh, the number is 060606, and is this the mark of the beast? And Christians, I've got to calm your fears on, on these things. First of all, um, we need to be very cautious and wise in regards to governmental authority. We need to be careful um, because uh, Christians throughout history, the people of God have not always been able to trust governmental authority. However, I will say this, we need to be careful about passing around conspiracy theories that are not, number one, factually accurate when it comes to seeking out that truth, and number two, that are not biblically sound. Um, uh, the, I the idea that um, the billionaires that are attempting to help mankind through 
uh, providing a vaccine through their own generosity is some sort of an entryway into the end times, I think is, is, is far beyond what the scripture would teach us and what I see happening right now. You might have your own opinion about that. Our church is very broad and has very different opinions on a lot of things, but I don't see that to be the case at all. Uh, one last question, and it is in regards to the, cons the idea of constitutional, uh, constitutional rights. Um, Dr. Snook, do you see this as a legitimate medical threat or simply an opportunity to limit our constitutional rights? Um, I, I think at this point it's definitely a, a very legitimate uh, concern and, you know, I think you could say threat, um, you know, just because of the fact that, um, you know, at, at the hospital I work at, we have these patients that, that are diagnosed with this, they're sick, they, um, you know, need health care and they need access to critical care. And so I would say it's definitely something that's legitimate, it's real. Um, and uh, I think it's something you know that we need to take seriously. That being said, I am very hopeful and, and excited to, to be able to get back to, to church and to be able to see everybody kind of face to face. Um, you know, hopefully that's uh, coming sooner than later. Um, but uh, uh, but I think specifically to answer that question, I think um, it, it is a real medical concern and it's it's something that's that's very serious. And like I said, kind of at the at the outset of the conversation, we really have not seen uh, something of this magnitude in any of our lifetimes. And so this is uh, truly something that I think, you know, we need to take seriously. And um, that being said, um, you know, I think we can all be very mindful of kind of our constitutional rights. And I think we need to be very protective of our right to, to meet as a church. And, and uh, you know, I think that, um, like we talked about this before, it, you know, had this happened 25, 30 years ago, you know, I think we're fortunate to have some of the social media and some of the technology capabilities to be able to have this discussion and kind of meet uh, together as a church. Um, and I think also, like we talked about before, this is, is not the goal. Hopefully we can, you know, we need to, to get back uh, in person. So yeah. I'm in complete agreement. And, and just, so, just so you understand where my heart is on this issue as it relates to genuine threat versus um, threat to uh, constitutional rights, I, I definitely see this as a threat because I trust the people around me um, as well in the medical community. But I also would say on top of that as a student of history that it's extremely wise for Americans to always be vigilant as regards to their rights. Um, that when we arrive at moments like this, powerful individuals tend to take advantage of those that, uh, that, uh, that, that they serve. And so I think an American always ought to, like one of our presidents said, um, Ronald Reagan, trust, but verify. And I think that that's a very smart thing for, and this is why I don't, I don't mind so much. And by the way, some of my more progressive friends that might be watching, um, uh, we get really, you might get really frustrated. Why are they talking about constitutional rights? We ought to be, as Americans, be vigilant in moments of crisis because history does tell us um, rights are taken away during those times and we have to be careful. Now I'm thankful because even in the state of Nevada, and in our United States government, we watched um, the Attorney General, uh, General Barr, this last week uh, talk about making sure that our First Amendment rights and our Second Amendment rights are not affected beyond what is properly measured during this time of an epidemic. And that is uh, – uh, that, that really did my heart good because mm -hmm. that's not always been the case in the United States or around the world. So be vigilant. Look for you to fight for your constitutional rights. Make sure that our rights are not being affected. But this is, um, at this point, continuing to be a legitimate threat. Dr. Snook, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. For those who may be um, interested in following up with more questions, uh, would it be okay if they emailed me directly and then I sure. could pass those questions on to you? Yeah. And maybe we'll do this again as the if the pandemic continues in the way that it is and we have not yet flattened the curve, maybe we'll have Dr. Snook back on. The next time we do talk to Dr. Snook, we'll talk more about the mission to Africa. For those who are not familiar, how can they look up that information? Uh, so we have a website. It's uh, www.snookstoafrica.com. So check that out. Um, and uh, we have our contacts on there, our emails, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, just uh, for everybody at Southern Hills, uh, we miss you guys. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing everybody in person. And uh, we're praying for, for you all. And uh, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks for coming, Doc. All right.